David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's Wednesday, March 29th, 2023. Time for another show. Let's do it all in one quick, long read. Uh, oh, yeah, right. Oh, I actually mentioned last night, uh, as I was putting together this morning's, uh, uh, what, post to tell you that we are on live. Uh, I don't know if I told you it was going to happen at 9 o'clock Eastern time. It, it is happening now. In case you didn't get that message, any of the previous, oh, I don't know, 12 years that I've told you that this was going to be the case. Ah, <sighs> lots of things happening this week. I thought it might be wise to bring in the, uh, we should have uh, tried to track the guy down. I don't know, I, you know, if he's still around. The uh, the FedEx commercial, back when they were just Federal Express, and they were using that old tagline of when it has to, absolutely positively has to be there overnight. Do they not use that tagline anymore? I don't see it very often. Anyway, now they're FedEx uh, because that's faster to say, I guess. But back in the days when they were just starting and they had that really fast talking guy talking about the, you know, the idea being the, the speed of modern business or whatever. And of course, watching the commercial yesterday, just to persuade myself that I remembered it correctly, that it was uh, a real thing, not something I imagined, but they used to have that guy, you know, was a speed reader of the scripts and, uh, this just, he just uh, went through the motions of a business day super fast. And I thought that would be the guy you need to read through all the stories that we could be covering today but instead we'll slow it down and we'll do it a little different and we instead we couldn't get that guy so we got the uh, Dunkin Donuts guy so he's on here to say it's time to make the donuts 50 times and uh, somehow we'll make news out of that all right well anyway uh, if you're old enough to remember those commercials congratulations uh, on getting social security I guess and uh we proceed from here. Greg's got plenty to go on. Israel is tops again, only because, as uh, Greg says, they've had more time to develop their day. They're ahead of us on the clock. Uh, we know more about what's happening in their news day than we know about what's happening with our news day. We'll find out later how our news day went. Uh, Israel's on the map for everybody. Because reasons and, uh, you know, we'll check in with them anyway. Uh, yes, there's much going on there. There's even stuff going on in, in my own personal life that actually has to do with Israel. And it's quite annoying, actually. Um, you're not going to believe it, but, uh, I won't tell you about it anyway, but it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's more thinking about Israel than I thought I was going to have to do in this or any other context. We'll put it that way. So I have Israel fatigue already, but that's okay. We can start that way. There's plenty more to get to. We're still on, I guess, indictment watch in the sense that uh, it's supposed to happen at some point. I think, didn't we hear earlier this week, probably from Greg, and he can tell us whether or not that's the case, that the grand jury wasn't meeting today anyway. So it wouldn't be today, but they're going to meet again Thursday or something like that. I don't know. I, it happens when it happens. I'm not too concerned about the timing of it at this point, uh, unless, of course, we can turn that into a massive fundraising hall the way he did, and I just don't see that as a possibility. So, okay. Uh, by the way, today in artificial intelligence news, I guess I can tell you, uh, Bing, owned by Microsoft, Skype, owned by Microsoft. What's happening these days is uh, normally I wake up to uh, messages. Well, not wake up to. Usually I'm awake by the time it happens. But getting messages from Greg as the show starts, uh, messages from Justice about everything going just fine, and I really don't need any more interference in my life at that point. Uh, then I've already, you know, got the, the invited interference, the, in, the help I need to get the show started. That's one thing. But now, at the top of my list, because Microsoft owns the list, I guess, Skype. I get messages in the morning from Bing, who's not even a person, and not even an intelligence. It's an artificial intelligence. And uh, it starts off. Uh, the other day I started to notice that he now butts in. And now it's start, I'm giving it. A, I'm assigning a gender to Bing. Uh, Bing Crosby's gender is the one I'm going to use. And uh, you know, how can I help you today? That's uh, message number one for the day. And uh, the thing is, there's no way uh, that I'm going to ask you to help me. And you could stop asking. And if you were really intelligent, you would figure that out. Um, all right. Well, anyway, uh, just, I just thought that was kind of interesting in a corporate 
and slash artificial intelligence slash Skynet slash Terminator, we're all going to die sort of way. It starts small. How can I help you? And then it becomes, I can't help you. Well, then I might as well destroy you. And and that's the story of the Terminator. Okay. Well, anyway, here comes Greg Dworkin, who's tired of hearing the story as it is and has is brimming with uh, stories of his own, even if they're borrowed from Israel. All right. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Uh, I'm fine. So we're okay. going to move from artificial intelligence to lack of intelligence, I suppose. Mm. Yes, right. Foolishness, one might call it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, uh, this artificial. Is, the, there no, are wise men and what wise men could do. And then there's what we're doing and what the Israelis <laughs> are doing. <laughs> I just collect the stuff, man. Yeah, I, don't I know. suppose. And I stopped doing that. So okay. uh, after Netanyahu, Bibi Netanyahu, prime minister of Israel, put the uh, judicial reform mm-hmm. on pause. Yes, right. It's gotten based pause. on uh, protests in the street. 10 to 1 in favor of him pausing, All 10 right. to 1 the opposition. Or not pausing there. is, you know, it seems like a good idea. Yeah. He's paused on a lot of other things. Part of the spark right. that uh, uh, fired up the populace, who had been protesting for months over uh, after the election, uh, Netanyahu uh, had not run on reforming the Judiciary reforming is, of course, in scare quotes. He didn't realize he needed to until too late. Oh, he knew he needed to because oh. he was uh, he already indicted realized. and he was, you know, He's fighting the fact that uh, he might get convicted. So he wants to change everything. Uh, you know, you can't uh, do anything against somebody who's in power. And then next is, and I'm always going to be in power. And so the next, you know, so on and so forth. That That's the fear. Uh, so, uh, you know, he does these things and the thing that sparked the huge outpouring of people on the street for 24 hours was him firing the very conservative Likud defense minister. Mm-hmm. So not only has he paused the judicial reform, but he's also paused firing the defense minister. The guy's still in limbo. Right. I think we talked about that on the show yesterday. He hasn't been fired. He hasn't mm-hmm. been rehired. He's still um, at his job. Yeah, I couldn't really uh, figure that one out. And, and I was looking for more news, he's, and there's he's, no he's, news. There is exactly. no news. I mean, he's just trying not to, to do anything. And then overnight, hmm. Biden went off script. I love when Ooh. Biden goes off script. Ice cream. Right? The the president's handlers, uh, and, and all campaigns do this. Everybody has handlers. They tell sure. you where to go. They tell you what to oh, do. Yeah. They tell you which direction to look. They tell you, you what, ask you know. them to. Yeah, they're hired to do you that. Wanna, uh, you're, yeah, exactly. Here's money. Do it. Yeah. Every I won't listen to you. Does but... that. It's not because Biden doesn't have it upstairs and he needs it. Everybody does this, but it's especially to a presidential mm-hmm. level. Mm-hmm. In yes. fact, he has an entire cabinet department, uh, also known as the Department of State, Okay. Whose job it is, <laughs> yeah, is this new? to sort What's of happening? say and write stuff that would ruffle the least number of feathers. Yes, that's as he talks job. about international relations. Y- yeah, and it is yeah. important to point out that every president has it. I, the, it we know every this, but the right wing is liable to say this is the first president who's ever done that. Yeah, exactly. Ronald Reagan never did it. Are you kidding? And, okay. and Biden tends to go off script because he knows his stuff and he knows what he wants to say and he knows what he wants to do. Yeah. And sometimes it, you know, as as all presidents uh, do, they chafe under the guidance of I have oh. to be like totally scripted on every single thing I say, do or blink. Yeah. And Biden has been around the block and says, I have an idea what's going on here. I think I'm just going to say what I want to say. Hmm. And so he did yesterday and he rebuked. Uh, Netanyahu in the harshest possible terms from an American president, which was really unusual. Mm, yeah, doesn't happen and to a lot. the point where you could go and you could interview State Department people who would say, "Well, we're surprised he said that." Well, sure. Well, that's not what we wrote. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could go interview them and get that comment. So here's I'm not going uh, to. Oritz. Biden's rebuke shock surprises Netanyahu as U.S.-Israel rift deepens. Netanyahu mm-hmm. thought tensions with the U.S. were under control, but Biden's statement underscored the simmering te- diplomatic tensions the premier was hoping to allay. Biden's oh. statement Tuesday that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will not be invited anytime soon to the White House shocked and surprised <laughs> the PM's office. 
Oh. While Netanyahu aides drew encouragement from Ambassador Tom Knighty's statement that the premier would be invited to the White House after Passover. After Passover mm. is a long time. It could be like 35 years from now. In six elections. Washington's tone escalated. We'll get back to that elections thing because that's key to this. Washington's tone escalated throughout the day and culminated with what was perceived as a humiliating statement by Biden. The president's mm. words reflected the U.S. administration's concerns over Netanyahu's control of his own government and doubts that the judicial coup is really off the table. At the heart of Biden's statement, it seems, lies an assessment that the Israeli prime minister who chooses to fire his defense minister mm. and erect the National Guard in the midst of the month of Ramadan must be reined in. Now, this is coming from Haaretz, which is the liberal paper. You can also follow the Jerusalem okay. Post, the conservative paper, or the Times of Israel, which is sort of in the middle. Hmm. In right. Biden's statement, he reflects the heights to which the current crisis has reached between the two nations from the day the government was formed. The Biden administration demanded Netanyahu demonstrate its policies are not set by his extremist ministers. Uh, the problem is they are. Now, I just added that last part. Oh. The problem is they are. Yeah, well, it's an issue. Sure. Right? Yeah. During these consistent messages from Washington, a senior Israeli diplomatic source denied over the weekend the existence of a crisis. Speaking to reporters, the official said this is not the first time the administration has tried to meddle in Israel's internal affairs, which is what Netanyahu's response was. Yeah. I expect we so love much. you. We're strong. We're allies. But don't mess with our internal affairs. They tried to remove Netanyahu from office twice before, he said, adding that issuing clarifications does not point to a deterioration in relations. We've reached a modus vivendi regarding the settlements. They're fully aware and appreciate fully our efforts to prevent escalation in the West Bank. That's from Haaretz. Okay. Times of Israel uh, reports something a little different. Oh. Here they have top Likud official, Biden is so weak, Netanyahu is looking ahead to the next U.S. election. <laughs> Oh well, okay. Now, if you want to, if you want to uh, talk about live in a bubble, just listen mm. to this. Boy. The official tells the site affiliated with the national religious community that Netanyahu is looking ahead to the next election in two years. Luckily for us, Biden is so weak; even backbenchers can speak out against him. Referring to the backbencher who said earlier that Israel is probably a bit more democratic than the U.S. Mm. and also said that Israel has no Maybe problem defending itself without American assistance. Okay. The Democrats yeah. won't win, even if a toaster and an iron run against them. The Democrats are finished what? in the U.S., the official confidently predicts. Those who understand U.S. politics know this, and thank God Netanyahu understands America, contrary mm. to what opposition mm. leader Yair Lapid thinks. Know. Yeah, our Americans. Right. Netanyahu is smiling politely at Biden, but he knows that very soon there'll be a Republican president. He also reiterates claims that the Biden administration is behind the anti-government protests Everybody understands the Americans are involved here up to their necks. So oh. according to the most extreme elements of Likud, and you have to understand involved. that in the United States, for example, when you say the Republicans say, or even the Republicans in Congress say, you really have to specify who it is. It's one thing for Mitch McConnell to say something, another thing for Marjorie Taylor Greene to say it, mm -hmm. uh, given the fact that she's the leader in the House. And, you know, it, it depends upon... Uh, who's speaking, uh, what yes. Kevin McCarthy says, doesn't matter. If you're Israeli, I would say, it's like Likud. So, uh, you could you know, understand it that way. Uh, here's another way to understand it. Uh, somebody was trying to explain to Americans what's going on in Israel. Now, uh, Ben Gavir is a racist who happens to be in charge of national security. And in order for uh, Netanyahu to get buy-in, on stepping mm. back from changing the judiciary, he had to promise Ben Gavir that Ben Gavir could build his own National Guard. Ne okay, I mean, Netanyahu thinks he needed this will happen. From... Ben Gavir thinks it will, okay. you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Paul Gross uh, tweeting, imagine Trump had gotten David Duke elected as congressman and put him in charge of the nation's police departments, and that's BB with Ben Gavir. Now imagine Duke is threatening to sabotage the administration somehow, and to keep him sweet, Trump gives him his own private militia. That's well, BB and Ben Gavir. Uh, and to me, it's, it's yeah. not hard to imagine. Imagine Marjorie Taylor Greene is a congresswoman, has veto power over Kevin McCarthy's... Wait. Actually, he, oh. that is what's yeah. going on right now. And, of course, uh, there are certain members of Congress, or say if David Duke came to Congress having been elected, I mean, and they do come with their own militia as it is. So it's not that difficult to understand. 
Uh, Noga Tarnopolsky, very good mm. reporter, uh, sort of an independent reporter, leans left, uh, uh, pro-Palestinian, writes, Netanyahu in power three months ago today, his uh, accomplishments, government plan stalled, society imploded, shekel crashed, mm. military mm. unraveled, yeah, sure. prime minister attacks the army, investors flee, POTUS rebukes him. Netanyahu Jr. sees U.S. funded Nazis Junior? in the streets. You heard like who'd sort of reflect that huh. when they talked about, uh, you know, the I mean, U.S. is behind the protest. Ministers besieged. PETA nixed in hospitals and jails. That's because they passed a law saying that during Passover, you can't bring unleavened bread into hospitals and jails. If you're Muslim, too bad for you. Mm. And Ben Gavir uh, gets his own militia. Now, <laughs> you have to understand he, he, uh-oh. Yeah. that in Israel, uh, we have two parties. Yes. That, Israel in, in has the fill in the blank. However, many members of Likud, there are like 120, 120 members of, uh, of, of the Likud. Knesset. There's 120 parties. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So when Likud says X, like looking at the U.S. and say, was it McConnell? Was it Marjorie Taylor Greene? Or was it some guy mm-hmm. from Tennessee that you never heard of? Yes. You know, it, 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 you don't know what it means. And it's hard to say, OK, this reflects the party. Mm-hmm. The party is many parties. Sure. That makes Still, sense to me. The idea that within Likud, there's a faction that thinks that all you have to do is hold your breath long enough for Trump to get reelected mm-hmm. uh, is part of what drives them. And that helps you understand whether or not they're going to give in if they're waiting for Trump to get reelected. Yeah. No, they're not. And on the other hand, are they being realistic? Well, of course not. Trump's not right. getting reelected. But, you know, that's another think, story altogether. I like how they think so. And, they, well, anybody who understands American politics understands that Trump is totally uh, going to be reelected. And uh, don't worry about it. You can literally right. we'll, just we'll talk about hold that your breath. But, but, you know, sure. again, that's the background to what's going hmm. on there. So uh, okay. I thought that would be helpful to try to understand, that is you know, when you hear news, thing. what's going on and how come it's not resolved. Hmm. Well, you know, if you have a strong enough faction who thinks that it doesn't need to be resolved because all we have to do is wait – then the Republicans come in and they'll support us in everything that we do. Then you understand why it's so difficult to get things resolved. Hmm. Okay. And, and of course, the U.S. has that. nothing to do with Israeli politics, and we're just waiting for Trump to be reelected. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. How, yeah, how do right. You, keep uh, your nose out of uh, Israeli politics. Yeah, that, and keep your nose out of our internal affairs, and we'll just wait here for you to elect a different president. That, yeah, that's exactly also right. problematic. Well, he's he's. Difficult. He's a riddle, that guy. <clears throat> oh, yeah, you know what? He is a riddle, actually. I was just thinking. I was uh, thinking of the name. There, here's my, my Israel joke for the day is uh, knock, knock, right? And and you say, who's there? And I say, Netanyah. And you say, that's Ooh. the punchline. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now we've gotten, uh, I don't know, just all of a sudden I'm like, hey, that makes it sound, there's a lot lighter if you think of him, him as the punchline of a joke. But, um, you know, the World War Three or yeah, that, Israeli yeah, Civil War first, thing. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, all right. Well, this makes it a lot easier to swallow, I think. All right. It's a huge problem. And uh, all right. But I mean, I don't recommend that they don't. know it's not over. Ordinarily, so, we let, say don't hold uh, your breath. But you could we got an election coming breath. up next week. we got a couple, actually. Next week? Yeah. <sighs> next uh, Tuesday, two okay. big elections. Uh, a Wisconsin uh, Supreme Court and okay. a Chicago oh, mayor. Yes, all right. And just before Passover, too. So uh, victory bread is permissible. <laughs> so this is from a website called Wisconsin Watch and is looking at – it's a nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom. And uh, as of the April 4th election coming, April 4th. liberal oh, Janet mm-hmm. uh, Protasewicz's campaign – Boy, did I spend a long time pronouncing that uh, and practicing. Has raised nearly. Congratulations. Judge knock, knock. Janet uh, <laughs> has uh, raised nearly $12 million more than conservative Dan Kelly, according wow. to the Wisconsin Democracy right. Campaign. But as of Monday, hmm. Kelly's allies lead in ad spending, with outside groups spending about $2 million more to support him or oppose her. Now, hmm. that's a little misleading because, so. as all of you election experts out there know, if the campaign spends money on ads, they pay lower rates uh, than if yes, outside okay. PACs spend money. And Protosewitz's campaign is spending the money themselves, and Kelly is getting all the money from Richard Uline that's going into PACs, and so it's mm-hmm. outside spending. All right. Usually so something like three to one. The figure uh, was more that expensive. they were 
they were spending more money on TV than they're spending more money on TV, but possibly getting less. However, gotcha. they may All be right. getting less bang for the bunk. Uh, yeah, or buck, bunk, whichever. Uh, it's the same thing when you're talking and about them. Bank so, for right. the so, uh, when they billionaires do don't care, I guess. And consequential election will determine hmm. whether Wisconsin's high court preserves its four to three conservative majority or flips to liberal control. I like the, in February, the contest control. became the most expensive court race in U.S. history. The democracy campaign hmm. estimates today it stands at thirty nine point seven million dollars. It's just astounding. Yeah. For well, I mean, look. The fact that they elect people is one thing. Uh, judges, yeah. Uh, Supreme Court justices. It is yeah. interesting. And, uh, you know, the fact that it costs the as much money is something else it. altogether. A data analysis by Wisconsin Watch of political ads in the first half of the general election found ads favoring Protosewitz dominated television and social media, outnumbering those favoring Kelly 23 to 1. Uh-huh. Okay. However, uh, hmm. Uh, again, the money's catching up. Reviewing 440 money. ads from February 22nd to March 14th, and good luck to the intern whose job that is, Oof. which ran on television, radio, and digital, and Facebook and Instagram ads from Meta's ad library. Wisconsin Watch found that 91% of the ads boosted Protosewitz. Ads supporting Protosewitz have emphasized the candidate's stance on specific issues. This is what I found most interesting, including abortion and redistricting, which could come before the court. And those are issues that benefit liberals for sure, but also have a broader coalition of support among Republicans. Polling shows a majority of Republicans favor redistricting reform. That is to say Mm anti-gerrymandering. And about a third oppose the Supreme Court decision overturning abortion rights, which is one of the reasons why Protosewitz is predicted to win. It's not just that she's outspending her opponent, but her... Uh, positions are more broadly popular. Well, when since when is that controlled elections? Oh well, God. when it's a statewide election, it matters. What? You know, when it when it's you know count the uh, yard voter suppression or when it's gerrymandered districts. You know, then, then yeah. it's different. The ads supporting Kelly are knocking yeah. Protestant, which largely feature descriptions of his values, yeah. such as constitutional conservatism, or portray Protestant as soft on crime. And interestingly, the uh, Wisconsin Watch actually has an ad up yeah. showing this video ad from WMC. It's called WMC Issues Mobilization Council, whatever that is. This video ad from WNC Issues Mobilization Council criticizes Milwaukee Wisconsin, County Circuit Judge Janet Protasewicz for sentencing some defendants to more lenient sentences than those requested by prosecutors. Which, by the way, anybody following the January 6th uh, trials understands that that happens like routinely all the time. Prosecutors yeah. almost never get completely what they ask for. Yeah, it's a it's a negotiation. Early ad spending in the Wisconsin Supreme Court race favored Protosewitz, and this, uh, but outside groups have invested heavily. Uh, and this ad says, "Call Judge Protosewitz at this number. Stop protecting criminals," and then shows okay. uh, uh, the yeah, white Janet stop. Protosewitz with pictures of. Uh, what appear to be two uh, people of color as if Uh she is protecting them. I see. And so uh, there you have Wisconsin. And and that's what's going on. So uh, there's been a lot of discussion I see online about the early vote because early voting has started. And uh, as in Georgia, Mm-hmm, yeah. You can look at the early vote and see where people are turning out, like the wow counties. Right. Good. They, th- this is the place with crucial counties, don't forget. Yes. They tend to be Republican-leaning, and they're turning out well. The least Republican of the three wow counties has the highest uh, turnout. Okay. And those areas yeah. were very much uh, Daniel Kelly's opponent, Janet DeRose, territory. So okay. whether there are people who are willing to vote for Protosewitz over Kelly is unclear. In other words, mm. what kind of persuasion has she done amongst Republicans? It's very strong in Dane County. Uh, you know, the numbers are pretty good for both sides, depending upon how you read it. The main takeaway, of course, is that in all cases of early voting, just about, you don't really know what's going on. You can't read well, anything no. into it. And the reason is, you know who's turning out, but you don't know who they're voting for. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, I, obviously you can't open the envelope. To learn that lesson over and over and <laughs> over. Well, turnout is great in Dane County. It's really heavily Democratic. Okay, but you don't know who they're voting for, and you don't know who they're voting for in the Wow counties, which is heavily Republican, yeah. but still turning out. In fact, uh, you know, the entire state uh, is probably going to turn out more than they did in 2022, mm. but less than they did in the primary that narrowed it down to Proto Saywitz and Kelly. Yeah. So it's not really clear what's going on. You have to wait for next week when the actual vote takes place. And that annoys people because everybody wants to know now who's going to win. And uh, uh, Proto Saywitz is favored by most of the analysts, but we don't know. Okay. It's not going to be a mm-hmm. slam dunk. She wins by eight. So forget that. You know, the question is, does she win by three to four? Oh, all right. Well, I mean, I, you know, a win's a win, but you I know, can't tell win? you until next week, apparently. Uh, but about this time, maybe next week, we'll have some good idea. Maybe. And then yeah. Opening envelopes. The day um, after, sometimes we actually know who won the election. That's right. If you don't, it's fraud. Right. So uh, the break is coming up. But after the break, I thought maybe what we would talk about, which is to say what I'm going to talk about, hmm. is uh, yes. uh, Trump and the Ew. fact that his support is uh, slipping away, leaking out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Leaking support. Various and sundry different ways of looking at the same question. Okay. Excellent. And uh, we'll address that and uh, the question of whether or not you can bring him leavened bread after the middle of next week. If, uh, I mean, we could offer that as a compromise. If you put him in jail in Israel, that might Well, just keep in mind, whenever we're talking about Trump, you have to specify whether you're talking about the primary, the general, or his policies. They're yes. all different. Right. And strengths and weaknesses are all different. Okay. Well, uh, we'll keep that in mind. And uh, all you have to do is keep it in mind for about two minutes in order to have some context to what happens when we come back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time. Just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air. And Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad. Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction. And whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't, do it without you. Hope you'll be on board soon too. Thanks for all your support. All right, welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. What were we supposed to... I I had something in mind... Trump Trump, 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 Trump. And you have to think Trump about might him be in different indicted ways. Today. Maybe it's a strong case. Maybe it's not. Maybe you won't be indicted at all. Right. You don't know. Maybe we have to wait until next week when they open the indictment to find out what's Wednesday's in it. Wednesday's going to be a great show because like, we find out everything. All right. Yeah. Election. Like on Wednesday, I could say for sure whether this Wednesday was it? he was indicted. Yeah. Well, didn't we I'll know that next hear Wednesday. that uh, was the was it the grand jury wasn't meeting Today, but was going to meet again Mondays, tomorrow. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. I don't know oh. if they're not meeting today. Oh, all right. They Maybe certainly it was didn't yesterday, yesterday that they weren't meeting, and and that's what. You, you, yeah. At some point on Monday, you told us the schedule, and then now it's Wednesday, and I forgot the schedule. But not a surprise. Now we know. So, so, so maybe, maybe it could come as early as today. Excellent. It could never come. We don't know. We'll have to wait. It bothers people. Don't write your stories in stone already. Uh, what is happening today, however, and this is indictment adjacent, Ooh. is that it's sunny day day in Georgia. Oh, it's a sunny day. For so sunny that means that uh, 
the Georgia General Assembly finishes today, hmm. and every bill that they have that they haven't finished with has to be done by today, because after signing day, I mean, right, or you're else done. It doesn't. Right. Uh, yes, right. Uh, remember that a lot of state legislatures work What's that way. Signy day again. Uh, signy <laughs> uh, day. I don't know. It's uh, signy die is a final adjournment, and I don't know what it actually means in Latin, but uh, until we die. I don't know. It's, it, looks, it looks like finally so, die is basically what the, it means. The Georgia General Assembly is considering a bill that reigns in hmm. local prosecutors. Okay. And word on the street is that Fannie Willis, the prosecutor hmm. in Georgia, potentially uh, uh, to present to the uh, Georgia grand jury, regular grand jury, uh, not the investigative special grand jury, but the you can indict regular grand jury, mm-hmm. was waiting for Georgia to General Assembly's signing day to finish so to protect herself against repercussions yes. and retaliation. It wouldn't come until next year. If it wouldn't come until next year anyway. So, See, this is the current theory. It doesn't make sense for a couple of reasons. Oh. Even if they passed it, it wouldn't happen right away, number one. Well, okay, that's one. Number two, uh, everybody was citing different cases that they were talking about that had nothing to do with Fannie Willis. Hmm. Okay. And number three, for all we know, since March 1st, Georgia regular uh, uh, grand juries convene, there might already be one that's already seeing this material. It simply mm-hmm. takes a long time to go through. And since it's secret, ah, then you wouldn't know. along with me, folks at home. Everybody we needs don't to know. Wait. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess it was a theory, right? You know, uh, well, why provoke the legislature into action when, if we actually do hold our breath for a week, uh, they will go away without having passed this thing. Whereas if you give them reason to then run to the press and say, that's it, we must make this uh, restraint on prosecutors our new legislation, then they would go and do it. How interesting, though, that everything is about their... Uh, they're soft on crime, those Democrats. And what do Republicans do about it? Restrict the power of prosecutors, of course. Hey, that's weird and give Well, the complaint is these prosecutors don't prosecute. They're not putting the people we want in jail. Hmm. And so you're going to make them less crime. able to make them do that. Hard on crime by something, something. Wave my hands. Mm-hmm. I, I did this with my hands, and so I fixed the problem. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, I mean, I guess they thought that they would leave it to judges instead, but uh, I don't know. Okay. So yes, uh, uh, discretion for prosecutors, unless of course the, the you exercise that discretion in ways we don't like, in which case no discretion for them as a crime fighting tool. Right. Meanwhile, the big, big news, I think, since we last spoke, not since your last show, but since we last spoke, is that uh, the judge uh, in the federal case in the the D.C. area said that uh, Mike Pence has to testify Mm. to the federal grand jury. Yes. Go ahead, Mike. And that's a big deal. He doesn't have to testify about what he did when he was running the Senate. That's constitutionally protected, but that was all in public. There's nothing to Mm. testify. Nobody cares. It's on C-SPAN. The question, right. The question is, I mean, what what could you testify? What happened behind the C-SPAN cameras that don't show you what's really going on in the chamber? We want Mike Pence to testify who was really sitting and who was standing and (laughs) what Mm -hmm. was going on when you I thought we knew all of that because of the fantastic camera angles of C-SPAN that day. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what he does have to testify is all that one in one stuff he had with Trump hmm. when Trump called him a pussy and, and how violent was the language and how, you know, how much did Trump really want him to do that? There's a whole list of videos that people put together of before January 6th in the run up. Mike Pence is going to do the right thing. I love Mike Pence. He's a good man. And if he doesn't. Trump said, oh, I'm not going to like him very much. Right. OK. Which is, you know, when you see it out of context without thinking about the violence that ensued because of it mm-hmm. is actually pretty funny and charming. And you understand why Trump has a huge advantage over Ron DeSantis, who could never pull that off. Hmm. He's going to do the right thing. And if he doesn't, I'm not going to like him very much. Yeah. Oh, that's Which is, uh, yeah, that's Trump doing his uh, mafia boss impression and exactly. saying, I know I'm on camera and you're supposed to understand this as a violent threat, but right. I'm but, saying it but, this way uh, so that wink, I don't wink, get nudge, charged. Nudge, I'm going to make you laugh over it. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's why I say out of context. Nonetheless, mm. uh, the judge said that 
uh, Pence has to testify about all that stuff. All right. He should do it. He, But if he does, because he hasn't said he won't, mm -hmm. and not look, yet. he's not going to be president. He might as well. This is going to be his legacy. But the point is, even if he fully cooperates, that's still going to take a while. So, uh, oh, you know, man. Georgia may finish before Jack Smith finishes. The Mar-a-Lago stuff may finish before the January 6th stuff finishes. Bread can and be allowed. And we have no, oh, no idea prisons. when Alvin Bragg is going to finish or whether he's going to do anything at all. So all of that is out there floating, churning, uh, you know. And uh, what's the effect on Trump? Well, he gets to raise money, but oddly enough, not as much as he wanted. Well, he wants all the money. Here's a piece from Puck, which is the beginning of the Trump isn't as strong as you think he is uh, oh, right. series. Let's start with this from Puck. Trump's fundraising Puck. fatigue, a lackluster pre-indictment gate, small dollar haul, highlights an unlikely vulnerability vexing the Trump campaign. The easy money isn't there. All right. The $1.5 million that Donald Trump allegedly raised off his looming indictment appears to be causing some agitation within the former president's orbit, likely because his insiders will agree $1.5 million isn't actually a huge sum compared to his past scandal adjacent fundraising glitches. <laughs> yeah. Well, remember those other scandals? He raised much more. Right. right? Exactly. Funny. After the FBI raided Mar-a-Lago, Trump raised $2 million in two days. Yeah, this he raised is just $40 million boring. in the first quarter of 2021 post January 6th. But the best fundraising days may be behind him, like when he raised $11.5 million on the day the Access Hollywood tape emerged. Yeah, you have to have a – got to have a courtroom scene and, and maybe have – if there are handcuffs involved, he could raise more money. He should, he should volunteer for that. But simply put, indictment or no indictment, the grassroots supporters simply aren't opening up their checkbooks the way they used to. Wow. Well, imagine how much money he could raise if he fell out of a police cruiser on the mm. way to prison. Of course, this is especially problematic for Trump, who can no longer rely on Republican mega donors. Indeed, most of the party's prominent money men are with DeSantis. For months, I've been hearing from top donors it's not just Trump fatigue or having to bail out his weak candidates like J.D. Vance and Blake Masters. <laughs> Fundraising events at Mar-a-Lago just feel stale, they tell me. Donors are tired of the Trump golf outings. It used to feel like an exclusive opportunity when Lindsey Graham would invite 20 people for a round at one of the president's clubs. But these mm -hmm. outings have become less special since candidates like Herschel Walker, Dr. Oz, and Vance copied the golf fundraiser playbook and started doing their own. Oh. Even Trump's New Year's events seem to have lost their luster now that there's a fundraiser every other day at Mar-a-Lago. True. I'm sure that's a part of it. I mean, also, he's just old and slow moving and it's not exciting anymore. Even when Perhaps he's there. in his money grubbing fervor, Trump has forgotten. That's what it says here money grubbing fervor that has forgotten that exclusivity still matters to the well healed who would pine to be invited to George W. Bush's Crawford ranch to clear brush or whatever. <laughs> right. Now paintbrush. Yeah. Just saying we'll have it at Mar-a-Lago. You're delusional if you think everybody's dying to go sit at top fundraiser. Aww. Not like it used to be. Okay. Everybody's paid their $200,000 entry fee, I guess. Right. Meanwhile, Ron DeSantis, a prickly pair, Seems disinterested oh. in donors or really anybody but himself and his wife, but he's created a gold dome around Life himself by setting the bar high. He only hosted one event in D.C. last year, and I've heard that he's now requiring hosts to raise $500,000 at a minimum. That's because he mm. hates people. He hates being with people. He hates shaking their hand. And he's basically saying, you got to raise a million dollars for me to touch you. All right. I don't want to see your face. I got to tell you, that's the most relatable thing about him. Yeah, I, I totally agree. <laughs> I would be that way myself. That's right. There's a million dollars to get me out of bed. If I can get that. to go and smile at you and pretend I care what Actually, you think. Actually, yeah, you got it. You know what? I'm thinking that humanizes him. Except exactly. for this fact that it, you know, turns him into a weirdo robot. Next on the list. Yeah. Top Republicans balk at Trump highlighting January 6 rioters, calling it politically unwise. And these are going to be Republicans in the Senate, not Republicans in the House. As we mm. said, the first segment, you got to specify which Republicans you're talking about. Right. Some Republican senators said they don't understand why Trump keeps relitigating the Capitol attack and those who were prosecuted for breaking the law. And it wow. had that big picture of him with his hand on his heart while they sang the January 6th anthem, the <laughs> January 6th playing in the background. Right. Top Senate Republicans broke with former President Donald Trump. His story by Seal Kapoor and Scott Wong and NBC News. 
Right. Uh, broke with him over his decision to feature video January 6th rioters at his weekend rally in Texas. By the way, it was Waco, Texas, That's and right. there was a reason it was in Waco, Texas. Yes. Let's not gloss over that. Some uh, disagreed with his judgment in playing a video. Other Republicans said it is an unwise political strategy for Trump to focus on the attempted insurrection as he seeks a comeback. People who violated the law should be prosecuted, and they have been, said John Cornyn, who previously mm. held the number two spot in Senate Republican leadership. I just frankly don't understand this, you know, retrospective look. When it comes to running for president, you don't want to relitigate all your grievances in the past. They want to know what your vision for the future is. So I don't think it's a formula for success. Obviously, Cornyn is focused on the general, not the primary. Otherwise, he wouldn't say that. I see. Has he spoken with the Israelis? Senator Lindsey Graham, a Trump ally and golfing partner. (laughs) All right. That's a way of describing him. Golfs. Trump mm-hmm. has raised money, broke with the ex-president's view. January 6th was one of the worst days in American history. Everybody's entitled to due process. If you're trying to suggest that those who are involved in January 6th are some kind of hero, no. Hmm. There'll be no effort on my part to whitewash January 6th, he added. That's mm-hmm. at least for 15 well, minutes until Trump yeah. tells him to say otherwise. Right. Yeah. Senate Minority Whip John Thune referred to his past comments condemning the January 6th violence and question Trump's decision to keep focusing on that day. It's living in the past, and I think more people want to hear about the things you're going to do to make the future better and brighter for them. Mm. Joni Erst said, I've already said January 6th is a horrible thing. They're obviously going down the line asking prominent Republicans to say something. Mm-hmm. Tom Tillis you pushed back the on those house, who guys. downplayed January 6th. Mm-hmm. There's been a narrative out there. There were people walking these hallways that were peaceful tourists. They're illegally present. I would ask anybody who thought this was an appropriate action. If that happened in their place of business, how would they feel? Mm-hmm. Of course, so- Ron Johnson offered a partial defense. <laughs> All right. This multi-tiered system of justice here, in which January 6th defendants are being treated more harshly. Well, that's because they committed treason. Treason yeah, is so, Ron. Right. Uh, it's a... Uh... He's worried it could happen to him. Okay. Uh, surprisingly, yeah. So I guess they, the reporters found that it was uh, fertile ground for these kinds of quotes uh, on the Senate side and then couldn't find the subway. And that was the end of the story. Right. They even found people in the House who thought it was inappropriate. Oh, they did. Oh, okay. I don't approve. I don't approve, said moderate Representative Brian Fitzpatrick a leader of the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus. Another moderate, Don Bacon Mm -hmm. in Nebraska, said Trump's actions demonstrated a lack of judgment and the way to lose in 2024. Mm -hmm. Chip Roy did the classic. I didn't see what he said. Oh, there you go. That's usually But explain why he's ready to move on from Trump, and I've endorsed Ron DeSantis. Okay. Marco Rubio said he didn't see the rally and declined to comment. Nah. (laughs) Because he's a profile in courage. And he's a senator. He's got all the cover in the world. Yeah. But he's from Florida and Florida's full of Florida men. Right. Now, this is Fox News and uh, Fox News website occasionally has good stories, unlike their infotainment uh, channel. Six in 10 Americans don't want Trump to be president again. 2024 poll. The poll found 39 percent of Americans have a favorable opinion. And this is a NPR Maris poll. We may have covered that, but, you know, it's worth, again, reiterating. Only 38% of national adults want Trump to be president again. Okay. So when you say that, well, Trump is still strong, well, not in the general. Uh, the Likud people who think that it's a given that the Republicans are going to win and mm. that the Democrats are collapsing are perhaps unaware of uh, anything that's actually happening in the United States in regard to politics. Right. But this poll should help them. Perhaps somebody should send one to them. Mm. Can't read it during Passover, so hurry. Uh, 76% of the Republicans, 34% of independents, and 11% of the Democrats want Trump to serve another four years. On the flip side, 89% of Democrats, a whopping 64% of independents, and 21% of Republicans don't want him to return. 21% of Republicans. If you lose 21% of Republicans, mm-hmm. uh, you're not going to win the White House. Yeah. But, I mean, there is a difference between don't want him to and will vote for him anyway. Well, but they may not vote at all. You don't have to vote for the Democrats. It's not a good number. Sometimes that's a a, uh, bridge too far to ask Republicans to Uh, do. But staying home, that's an option. Uh, Yeah. Uh, You know what? Go to Israel just for a visit. That would be an excellent time. Mm. We should give free trips to Israel during uh, the election in 2024, like one of those 
uh, like the flyers that say uh, vote by text, don't bother going to the polls, or uh, make sure you show up on Wednesday for extra votes or something like that. So uh, this one yeah, is a Israel. deep dive into their own poll by uh, PBS, oh. PBS, NPR. Are Trump's legal troubles yes. earning him Republican support? Currently, the former president is the focus of four different investigations of misconduct at the federal, state, and local levels. In New York City, a grand jury is considering whether to indict Trump over allegations he paid hush money to Stephanie Clifford, also known as Stormy Daniels. Yes. Ahead of the 2016 presidential election, no sitting of former U.S. presidents ever been criminally charged. Taking a closer look, 46% of Americans think he's broken the law. 29% of Americans say he believes they believe he's done nothing illegal, but he's done something unethical. Oh. Now, not illegal, but unethical. Does that matter? Uh, it depends. To the judge, yeah. Uh, is there anybody who thinks he has also been ethical? I'm just curious. Well, he's done nothing wrong, 23%. Okay, nothing at all. Nothing wrong. But 29% nothing. say he... It was he... a perfect phone okay. call. <laughs> all right. It's the wrong number. Do you 23%. count that? Okay. All right. Well, that's the normal number. Now, Republicans were twice as likely as Americans overall to find no fault in Trump's actions. That would be putting it at nearly 50 percent. But uh, again, if you're talking about a general election and only a quarter less than a quarter, like a fifth of the population hmm. thinks you've done nothing wrong and that's your base and everybody else thinks, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, apparently, that's uh, that's the new Israeli math. That's uh, that's a majority. I mean, I, and I guess it is if you can, you know, effectively block people from voting or just arrest them. Though the former president has railed against investigations he faces, a majority of Americans, fifty six percent, think the investigations are fair. Meanwhile, eight out of ten Republicans take the opposite perspective. So we're used to this now. But again, you always have to keep in mind there is what Americans think and there's what Republicans think, and they ain't the same. Mm -hmm. Three okay. factions, people who would never elect Trump, people who simply want a candidate who can take back the White House. Those are the ones who don't like Trump but would vote for him. And people who would walk through a wall for him make up the Republican Party right now, Whit Ayers Polster said. Mm -hmm. I mean, we asking, should give them the chance uh, to do that. Asking the questions – about whether or not you want to see Trump reelected implicitly poses another, said Whit Ayers. How badly do they want President Biden out of the White House? While headlines about Trump's legal troubles may refresh the loyalty of his most ardent supporters, Amy Walter cautioned that Trump's investigations could alienate the swing voters you need to win a general election. Well, duh, that's what we keep talking about. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, she said, this series of unprecedented investigations could be self-defeating if the weight becomes so heavy it actually pushes Republicans away from him. And again, the Alvin Bragg one won't do it if, in fact, that happens. The others may well. Okay. Her point and Eris' point is a lot can change and the Republican primary is still wide open. So Trump is leading in the primary. DeSantis appears to be fading, but we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. No, we can, hey, last in the series, wait. this is by Aaron Ooh, Blake. Yeah. How big is Trump's true believer base? As he seeks to mobilize his supporters against the potential indictment, his truly committed base isn't the majority of the GOP anymore. Right. And we're not even talking about a majority of the country. It's not a majority of the GOP. Problematic if you are looking to be nominated. As Trump seeks Let's to say. mobilize his base against potential indictment, big question is how big is Trump's true believer base? How many people are willing to stand by Trump no matter what? And this matters both when it comes to any backlash against an indictment and for Trump's 2024 presidential prospects. The answer, well, diehard support remains substantial, but the number has clearly shrunk. I'm so for those of sure. you who just say, oh, you know, forget about all that garbage. They'll just vote for him regardless. That's true for some. Yes. But the number has clearly shrunk. And it's not apparently a, a majority of the Republican Party. It's a somewhat subjective exercise but there's a number of measures we can isolate. One of the best ways to look at the question is to focus on how many Republicans view Trump not just favorably, but very or strongly favorably. And by this measure, his support has declined significantly since 2020. While Fox News polling in October 2020 showed that seven in 10 Republicans had a strongly favorable view of him, by December 22, 
that 69 percent had dropped to 43. That's mm. a pretty big jump. Unfavorable yeah, well, views of Trump have increased power, from guys. one in ten to two in ten. But nearly as significant is the movement from strongly favorable to merely somewhat favorable. And that movement has been steady. And then they go ahead and show a graph and a chart that uh, that uh, shows that. While few pollsters have regularly broken down perceptions of Trump in this way, data from those who have echoes Fox's data. AP Nork, for example, Pew. Uh, Pew has Republican-leaning voters who gave him a very warm number between 76 and 100. 41 percent lowest mark since the 2016 campaign and down from 61 percent in April 2020. Another telling measure is how many Republicans view themselves as Trump first rather than GOP first. NBC News asked that question, gauging whether GOP leaning voters view themselves more as supporters of Trump or supporters of the party. NBC's most recent poll in January showed 33 percent viewed themselves as Trump first and a majority said that while he was in office, they don't say that anymore. Uh, Related to the above is a percentage mm-hmm. to profess to be 2024 dead enders, those who would want Trump to run as an independent if he was denied the GOP nomination. Uh, it's an instructive measure because it represents a scenario that would in all likelihood cost the GOP the presidency. And in a Monmouth University poll last month, 27 percent of Republican leaning voters said they'd want Trump to run as an Indy versus 60 percent, 67 percent said they wouldn't. Hmm. In another poll, 28 percent said they would vote for Trump in that scenario, even if DeSantis was the GOP nominee. Which brings us to the possible indictment. Maris came out with the new poll Monday and the percentage you think he's done nothing wrong is uh, 45 percent. With with Republicans, majority Republicans acknowledge Trump's done something at least unethical. And they're all different measures suggesting varying degrees of true devotion, but none are approaching a majority. And most used to be a majority view in the GOP, Hmm. which doesn't mean there couldn't be a rallying effect. And in addition, we're still talking about significant numbers, even in their depressed state. But Trump's also been harping on these things for a long time. And he's continued to see his base erode despite that. So, you know, those are all things to take, keep in mind. Hmm. And one of the important things, of course, is one of the big differences between DeSantis running and Trump running. And you could say, you know, ask the question, well, who's worse? And the answer is yes. Right. And they're worse in different ways. DeSantis doesn't necessarily bring out the I don't usually vote, but while Trump is in office or running, I will vote for him. I certainly won't vote in midterms, giving red waves a a problem in developing when Trump's not on the ballot. But if Trump is on the ballot, I might turn out. Hmm. Not clear DeSantis can get those voters, even if both lose to Biden. DeSantis' down ticket Republican performance yes. may be better hmm. uh, than we want, but not as good as what it would be with Trump. Okay. Because yes, Trump will bring right. out those voters that DeSantis can't bring out. So if Trump is on the ballot... Uh, then people who don't normally vote may come out and vote for Republicans. Yes. And so that's something to keep in mind in terms of what, if you're a Democrat, just, you know, eating popcorn on the sidelines and trying to decide who should win, that has to go into the equation. Mm. Yeah, I guess so. You you, you want to worry about those down ballot races. Okay, well. Yeah, mm-hmm. the trouble is we don't worry enough about those down ballot yeah. races. And that's one of the reasons no. why we are where we are and why you get... Uh, you know, places like uh, Florida ready to ban books and why you get places like Idaho ready to ban interstate travel for abortion or at least restrict it. And why you get Ohio targeting higher education and telling them that, uh, you know, you can't do uh, diversity, equality, inclusion programs mm-hmm. and your mission statements have to uh, exclude any controversial topics I mean, all this stuff is on the agenda uh, because we don't pay enough attention to down ballot. Yeah, true. Uh, you know, as you were going through the numbers, uh, well, a lot, a lot of thoughts, of course, occurred to me. Well, one is, of course, uh, that it occurred it's to me that uh, the further out you are from an election, the more leeway we give the experts who want a, to give an answer as to what's going to happen are allowed to to make those predictions. But if you get within the week of election, there's like a, a period of silence, like with the 
uh, public offerings in the stock exchange, I guess. Right before you actually find out, everybody has to stop trying to predict what's going to happen. Just wait a week. But if it's a year and a half away, go ahead. Well, part of that is they're assuming, the pundits are, that uh, your memory is very short. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, then you can right. if I say get it, it now, wrong. And you're not going to remember true. what I said. But if I said it the week before the election and I'm wrong, you will yeah, never let me forget That's it. a good point. That's a good professional practice. Uh, I mean, it's not good necessarily for the rest of us, but it's a good And then if you practice. bring up what I said a year and a half ago, you said, yeah, but conditions changed. Right. Okay. So I think that's safe. Uh, also, it made me think, as you were saying, well, you know, it's so clear that he doesn't even have anything close to a majority inside the Republican Party. There's no way you can win with that. And I wondered whether maybe that's why the Israeli uh, folks are having such difficult. I mean, it may just be wishful thinking, but they may also be thinking, I don't have anything near a majority either, but look at me, I'm prime minister. Yeah, the difference is I have 72 yeah. parties. Right, and so they don't really quite grasp exactly what's happening here necessarily, or then they say, yeah, but he may fracture everything and run as an independent. So that's three parties. So that's closer to 72 than it was before when it was just yes, two. Yes, if he fractures everything, it feels more like stuff I'm used to. So, you know, what's yeah. the problem? I mean, maybe they have a point in that, but uh, but it likely doesn't matter to us here. Uh, and also, they do coalition governments like they do in Europe. I mean, they may think that, and who knows, they may be right to some extent, given that we have to interview, you know, how, what do Republicans think of Trump? I don't know. How many of them are you going to ask? Because you, you never can tell. All right. Now this last one is, uh, hey, hey. we'll finish out the today's uh, segment. New York Times, Republicans face setbacks and push to tighten voting laws on college campuses. Party officials across the country have sought to erect more barriers for young voters who tilt heavily Democratic after several cycles, which their turnout surged, mm -hmm. but it's not working so well. Okay. Uh, they're uh, educated uh, individuals. Worked in Ohio, Idaho, but uh, very few other places. Uh, okay. Uh, didn't work in New Good. Hampshire, Virginia, Texas. Yeah. Uh, I see on uh, Twitter people are still calling Glenn Youngkin uh, a moderate. <laughs> Well, it's nuts. It's what it gets printed. You got to keep doing it, apparently. He's far from. Anyway, yeah. that's the story for now. Okay. And we'll be back tomorrow and see if there's other stuff you want to talk about. Uh, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. We'll ask the Israelis if there's anything for us to talk about. All right. Well, I guess that's, uh, by the way, that's a good lesson, too. If you're doing your voter suppression uh, tactics, they, I guess maybe the kids who were studying government at the time are probably going to be a little bit less susceptible to it, maybe. I don't know. That could be the outcome. That could be the reason for it. I don't know. But thank you. And uh, we'll figure out uh, whether right. you have to wait until tomorrow to find out whether we were right about today. All right, Greg. We'll see you then. All right. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Man, alive. Okay, well, let's see. Uh, where to go from here? Let's, uh, we'll circle back around and read the New York Times entry on Mike Pence and the ruling that he has to testify to see if there's any, uh, any nuance that we might be able to tease out of that. Um, I think it's more or less, it's pretty clear. Kind of. What's going to happen? But I guess we have to analyze everything through the lens of what if you just don't? How long can it last? And uh, Mike Pence isn't always the isn't the guy that you think of employing that strategy first and foremost in the same way as you do about uh, Trump. But I think I saw this article yesterday shared on social media along with the commentary that the uh, the commenter's opinion was that the judge here was saying, listen, uh, or, or where were we? We're in the uh, in, in trial court or in the uh, uh, court of appeals here. Well, we'll go and take a look here. I guess uh, at any rate, uh, the the idea was that the judiciary was saying enough is enough. No more. Uh, we've had it with the delaying tactics. We're not going to permit them to uh, to to continue to work the way you've counted on them working in the past. I don't know. We'll see whether the facts. Or the reporting, anyway, bears it out. Pence must testify to January 6th grand jury judge rules. And I guess since uh, we're talking judge singular, we must be talking about uh, district court level. The ruling in Washington, says the subheader, was the latest setback to efforts by former President Donald J. Trump's legal team. And remember, I guess they must be running the uh, the show even when it comes to Pence, which is kind of amazing. Um, hmm. 
So I guess it was Pence not represented by his own team there. Was this uh, this was the Trump team objecting to the order or the subpoena? Well, let's I'll read on and find out. The ruling was the latest setback for two efforts by Trump's legal team to limit testimony to grand juries investigating him on various matters. Alan Fuhr and Maggie Haberman teaming up on this piece. A federal judge has ordered former Vice President Mike Pence to appear in front of a grand jury investigating former President Donald Trump's attempts to overturn the 2020 election, largely sweeping aside. That's sweeping that's going on. Is that a sweeping noise? Sweeping aside two separate legal efforts. That's the second sweeping by Mr. Pence and Mr. Trump to limit his testimony, according to two people familiar with the matter. Everybody's trying to limit his testimony, I guess. The twin rulings on Monday by Judge James E. Boas, Boasberg, Boasberg, I don't know how he pronounces, B-O-A-S-B-E-R-G, in federal district court in Washington, were the latest setbacks to bids by Mr. Trump's legal team to limit the scope of questions that prosecutors can ask witnesses close to him in a separate investigation into his efforts to maintain his grip on power after his election defeat and into his handling of classified documents after he left office. So it's the Jack Smith case, obviously. In the weeks leading up to the Capitol attack by a pro-Trump mob on January 6th, and you know, it was January 6th, 2021, in case you forgot, Mr. Trump repeatedly pressed Mr. Pence to use his ceremonial role overseeing the congressional count of electoral college votes to block or delay certification of his defeat. Whew. Prosecutors have been seeking to compel Mr. Pence to testify about Mr. Trump's demands on him, which were thoroughly documented by aides to Mr. Pence in testimony last year to the House Select Committee that investigated the January 6th riot and what led up to it. So we already kind of know what everybody else says Trump said to Pence. Now, because reasons, we need to have Pence say, yes, that's what happened. I don't know. This month, Mr. Trump's lawyers asked Mr. Uh, asked rather jo, uh, Judge Bosberg's predecessor as chief judge for the court. This will help you remind. Okay, who is this Bosberg? He's the new chief judge for the federal district court in Washington D.C. That's the job that was last week held by Beryl Howell, with whom we've all become pretty familiar. Okay, so uh, the new chief judge now takes over the administration of this case. So Trump's lawyers have asked Judge Bosberg's predecessor, or last week they asked predecessor Beryl Howell to limit Pence's testimony. Not Pence's lawyers, Trump's lawyers. Asked to limit Pence's testimony by claiming that certain issues were off limits because of executive privilege, which protects certain communications between the president and some members of his administration. At the same time, lawyers for Mr. Pence, I knew there had to be lawyers for him somewhere, also asked to limit his testimony. They did so by arguing that his role as the president of the Senate meant that he was protected from legal scrutiny by the executive branch, including the Justice Department, under the Constitution's speech or debate clause. That provision is intended to protect the separation of powers. While Judge Bosberg issued a clear-cut ruling against Mr. Trump's attempts to assert executive privilege. His ruling on the speech or debate clause was more nuanced, according to a person familiar with the matter. The judge affirmed the idea that Mr. Pence had some protection under speech or debate based on his role in overseeing the certification of the election inside the Capitol on January 6th. But Judge Bosberg also said that Pence would have to testify to the grand jury about any potentially illegal acts committed by Mr. Trump, the person familiar with the matter said. Okay, so that's interesting. And I guess here, I mean, I guess that's a good uh, conclusion, I guess, even on the speech or debate clause. Like, okay, you're protected from being criminally charged with any, uh, well, from, from being criminally charged in any way, uh, on things that you said or even possibly did during speech or debate inside the, well, in, inside the House chamber, or for that matter, inside the Senate chamber when you were uh, 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 overseeing 
the uh, debate about the about uh, for the debate that the Senate was having over whether or not to accept the electoral votes of various states once objections were lodged. So anyway, no matter where you, which chamber you were working, you had a, a, a role in the, arguably in the legislative branch. So we're not asking you about that. And I mean, I think that's a pretty good solution, right? You have to testify against Trump if he asked you to break the law. And you don't have to testify about anything that you were debating inside the chamber or even outside the chamber, so long as it was arguably legislative or or business related to the legislature. But uh, that's okay because if you were actually working uh, according to the rules and fulfilling your ceremonial duty, there would be no way for you to be helping Donald Trump break the law to the extent that you were helping to break the law or fielding questions from him about breaking the law. Well, that would be interesting. I don't know whether that's actually all in the opinion or not, but it would be an interesting way of dealing with it in the opinion and say, well, if he was asking you to depart from uh, the limits of your power in the legislature, but you're saying I shouldn't have to testify about it because I'm protected by the speech or debate clause. Well, you know, one of the things that like it wouldn't be protected by speech or debate if you showed up on the House floor and you lost a debate and you shot a fellow member of Congress. uh, You would say that's kind of outside of the intended protection of the speech or debate clauses. That wasn't speech or debate. That was you just perpetrating violence. If you debated someone and talked about shooting them and they wanted to prosecute you for that, you might be able to say, well, that was just speech or debate. I don't know. So if you depart from the role that you say is offering you this protection, I suppose the protection falls apart. But it is sort of a peripheral issue. Um, And interesting that Trump's uh, lawyers didn't jump on that bandwagon too, just even though they don't really have any grounds for asserting it. uh, Why not do so just to waste time and make things take longer? Anyway, people close to Mr. Pence, to return to the actual article, have said for weeks that they expected he would have to testify to some degree to the grand jury. The New York Times reported that the Justice Department had been seeking an interview with Mr. Pence as far back as late last year. Really should have been even earlier than that, don't you think? Judge Boesberg's decisions concerning Mr. Pence came a little more than a week after Judge Howell issued a ruling that... More than a half dozen other former Trump administration officials, including Mark Meadows, Trump's final chief of staff, could not invoke executive privilege to avoid testifying to the grand jury investigating Trump's attempts to overturn the election. The ruling by Judge Howell, who stepped down as chief judge on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, right? Okay. Paved the way for grand jury testimony for Mr. Meadows, one of his deputies, Dan Scavino, Robert C. O'Brien, who was probably celebrating St. Patrick's Day at the time, who served as National Security Advisor, John Ratcliffe, the former Director of National Intelligence, remember that guy, and Stephen Miller, uh, noted um, um, uh, sushi-phobic, if you say the right thing to him. Stephen Miller, one of Mr. Trump's speechwriters and top advisors. Okay, Mr. Trump and some witnesses in the election inquiry have tried for months to limit their scope of grand jury testimony, prompting a pitched behind-the-scenes battle waged, like all issues involving grand juries, in sealed court filings and closed-door hearings. Mr. Pence was one of the last major witnesses to litigate the boundaries of his grand jury testimony. Two of his closest aides, Mark Short and Greg Jacob, were ordered to appear before the grand jury last year, as were two top lawyers in Mr. Trump's White House, Pat Um, our big good friend, Patsy Baloney, Pat Cipollone and Pat, the other Pat, Philbin, the two Pats, really. In uh, one of her final acts as chief judge, Judge Howell issued a similar ruling in the classified documents inquiry. She ordered that M. Evan Corcoran, you forgot about the M, didn't you? A lawyer for Mr. Trump would have to testify to the grand jury conducting that investigation in spite of assertions of attorney-client privilege that he had made on Mr. Trump's behalf. In making her decision, Judge Howell found that prosecutors in the office of special counsel, Jack Smith, who is overseeing both grand jury investigations, had met the threshold for what is known as the crime-fraud exception. We knew this. 
That allows prosecutors to work around attorney-client privilege if they have reason to believe that legal advice or services were used to further the commission of a crime. In the federal inquiry into Mr. Trump's efforts to remain in power, Mr. Pence has always been a potentially important witness given the central role he played by refusing to go along with Trump's demands on January 6th and the conversations he participated in at the White House in the weeks preceding the riot. In public and in private, Mr. Trump tried to pressure Pence to take part in a plan to reject certification of Biden's electoral college victory, urging Pence to agree to flout the Constitution on the critical date of January 6th was part of a plan by Trump supporters that also included creating at least the appearance that there were alternate slates of pro-Trump electors from swing states that had clearly been won by Mr. Biden. The electors' plan is under scrutiny by federal prosecutors as part of the investigation being led by Mr. Smith, the special counsel overseeing the Trump-related investigations for the Justice Department. So everything is under his, is in his tent now. So, uh, oh my, I hope he's going to do this uh, correctly and fairly. Between November 5th, 2020 and January 6th, Pence was subjected to an intense pressure campaign from a range of Trump associates outside the government, including John Eastman, a lawyer working with the president, and from Trump himself. During that time, Pence had his counsel research what his powers were with regard to January 6th, and then over time made clear to Trump that he did not believe he had the authority that the president insisted he did. In addition to shedding light on Trump's role, testimony from Pence could also be important in the inquiry into other people involved in the efforts to keep Trump in office, including Mr. Eastman. By January 5th, Trump's efforts had become so intense that Mr. Short, Pence's chief of staff, called the vice president's lead Secret Service agent to his West Wing office to tell him that Trump was going to turn on Pence and that they may have a security risk because of it. That's pretty serious. The next day, Trump publicly pressured Pence in a rally address to a pro-Trump crowd at the Ellipse near the White House, then urged his followers to march, he says, quote, peacefully and patriotically to the Capitol. Once there, hundreds swarmed the building, some chanting, hang Mike Pence. So his admonitions to remain peaceful did not work. Mr. Pence, who is considered a presidential, who is considering a presidential campaign of his own, foolishly enough, has since published a memoir in which he details some of the conversations that investigators are interested in having him speak to in a closed setting, which also likely will undermine the case that he should not be uh, compelled to do so since he's already basically done as much. All right. So basically, though, they have his aides testimony already as to what uh, Trump was doing and saying. And they think that it will make a difference somehow in charging Trump possibly to have Pence saying directly, yeah, yeah, those guys are right. They actually did those things to me. All right. Interesting. Meh. You know, uh, it was good to have the nuance of the situation on the record. It'll help uh, untangle things later if they get complicated again in the reporting. Eh, okay. All right. Let's see. Other things that I put aside. Uh, this was an interesting story, just to change direction entirely. I thought this was interesting just in terms of addressing various right-wing myths. Uh, keep in mind, once again, that uh, in, in my view, the proper response to this is, once again, every Republican accusation is a confession you need to change my mind about that, but so far no one's been able to do that. Um, local-ish uh, item from the Pacific Northwest, that is to say local to Justice uh, and to Joan McCarter, and not to me, but 24 Washington state residents, it says here in this Seattle Times headline, have been indicted in an, quote, Aryan family drug ring. Aryan family here, not, uh, not not an actual family. It's a gang. It's a prison gang of uh, Nazi white supremacists. And as it turns out, they are also uh, you'll never believe it. They're they're drug dealers, but but a particular kind of drug is what makes it so interesting. Amanda Zhu is the uh, reporter here. Z H O U uh, reporter, staff reporter for the Seattle Times. A federal grand jury. 
They're all very busy these days. A federal grand jury has indicted 27 people, but only 24 of them, I guess, are Washington residents, many with ties to the Aryan family white supremacist prison gang for drug trafficking, prosecutors said Monday. Interesting all by itself, of course, because they're already in prison. They'd say how you get into a prison gang, I guess. So I don't know. Maybe they're not. Maybe there's some working on the inside, some working on the outside, some are distributing the drugs inside the prison, and it's just sort of like, hey, man, once I once we caught them and put them in prison, I thought that they were out of our hair, but apparently they're not. Anyway, two dozen of those indica- uh, indicted rather are Washington residents, and the rest are from Arizona, interestingly enough, according to federal prosecutors, but... Three, all but three of them have been arrested in the last five days, prosecutors said. So I guess they were once in prison and in the Aryan family prison gang, but now they're out and I guess still in it uh, because uh, there's an alumni chapter, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, a coordinated arrest and search operation last Wednesday involving 10 SWAT teams and more than 350 officers yielded, in case you were wondering why 10 SWAT teams and that many officers, 177 guns, 7 kilograms of drugs, and more than $330,000 in cash from 18 locations in Washington and Arizona. The alleged group leader is accused of trafficking, what's he selling? Meth, sure. Other drugs? Absolutely. Which other drugs? Fentanyl in particular. And so, I must, this is where I pause and say, Hey, we got to do something about the border. I'm going to. It's like partially a Trump line. It's not only Trump, but many other people. So the border is a disaster. They're importing fentanyl this way, and uh, Mexican drug gangs, and yada yada, and uh, maybe China somehow. I don't know something something. Uh, anyway, as it turns out, uh, in this instance, the big distributors of fentanyl in this part of the country are. Well, it's the same white supremacists that back the people who scream that it must be the Mexicans doing all the fentanyl stuff. So, as it turns out, every Republican accusation is, in fact, a confession. We don't know what their voting record is, these people, but uh, we have some idea of where they might fall on the political spectrum if you were forced into uh, picking uh, a team for them, let's say. So there you go. The alleged group leader... Uh, accused of trafficking fentanyl, methamphetamine, and other drugs into Washington, Idaho, and Alaska, according to prosecutors. Man, this is a border state thing. Help. Of, I mean, there is a, an Arizona connection. So it might be that they were getting their drugs from Mexico. I don't know. But as it turns out, uh, Alaska is where they're distributing it. So that's about as far from our southern border as you can get, even if you go the other way around the globe. Anyway. The operation and investigation took over a year and a half and included wiretap interceptions, according to a memo submitted by the U.S. Attorney's Office. The FBI led the investigation, which included help from other federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. Um, This is really the end of the useful bit of the news, but uh, there's just one more paragraph to throw in here. Uh, You want to hear from the local police? This operation is an example of the difference we can make when we collaborate to keep illegal guns and drugs from hitting our streets Tacoma Police Department Chief Avery Moore said in a news release. Super exciting. Thank you, Avery. We had to hear from somebody on that one. Anyway, uh, not a national story uh, per se, but uh, once again, as it turns out, uh, all the complaints about fentanyl and yada yada and all the weird brown people and possibly uh, Chinese people who are involved in all of this, when it comes to street-level arrests, not only are they white, they're white supremacists on top of it all, so... Just wanted to kind of point that out. I thought that was uh, of some interest, perhaps, to some of you. Okay, probably not of interest to you. The next item in pocket, uh, this is really a personal item, and I put it in pocket because I don't have anywhere else to just store things that I happen by that I think are interesting and I want to read later. Uh, I guess I could just open another app, but who wants to register with another app? At, just so you know what's going on in my life, there is a fast, no-need focaccia which is a gateway into the world of baking bread, according to the Washington Post. And if you've been looking for a simple focaccia recipe, this is the place to do it. Should I Now Now I have to, I shouldn't have said anything, because now I have to send it to Scott, and he can share it with all of you. I don't know. There may be a huge fan base for focaccia or bread baking in general. Uh, it was there. I'm distracted. 
I'm looking at it. I thought I'd share it with you, you know, and, and, and good, good luck and good eating to you. Okay. So now back to the news. I knew that there was something else here. And if I just scroll further, uh, you can find all these other items that I wanted to share with you. Let's see. Uh, how about this one? I mean, this will come as a surprise to approximately zero of the listeners to this program, but it's nice that it's being noted and it's always worth talking about. I just thought this headline was, well, true and, uh, you know, worth spending some time on. NPR had this piece on, uh, when was this? March 21st, so a little over a week ago. I just, I thought the headline was true and revealing at the same time. Private opulence, public squalor, that's a borrowed phrase, how the U.S. helps the rich and hurts the poor. Well, you know, you're already aware of all these things, uh, of the fact that these exist, but it was an interesting thing to see it brought out in the open and discussed, and by NPR of all places. Dave Davies has the byline on this. It makes a good discussion piece. Over 11% of the population, they open, uh, about one in nine people, lived below the federal poverty line in 2021, but Princeton sociologist Matthew Desmond says neither that statistic nor the federal poverty line itself encapsulate the full picture of economic insecurity in America. There's plenty of poverty above the poverty line as a lived experience, Desmond says. About one in three Americans live in a household that's making $55,000 or less. And many of those folks aren't officially considered poor. Uh, but they feel poor. That's, you know, that's the reality of it. But what else do you call trying to raise three kids in Portland, let's say, on $55,000? And there's very little else you can call it and be accurate, I think. You're right. Growing up in a small town in Arizona, Desmond learned firsthand how economic insecurity could impact the family's stress level. He remembers the gas being shut off and his family home being foreclosed on. Those hardships would later drive his research, specifically on the question of how so much poverty could exist within a country as wealthy as the United States. And uh, it's a good question. And by the way, look at, uh, I mean, he's come a long way, right? Living in poverty growing up, uh, family home being foreclosed on, and now a sociologist, uh, not only a college professor, but Princeton. I mean, that's landing on your feet. Desmond's 2017 book Evicted, for which he won the Pulitzer Prize. Wow, that's landing on your feet. Examined the nation's affordable housing crisis through the lens of those losing their homes. His new book, Poverty by America, that's interesting, that's a great title, studies various factors that contribute to economic inequality in the U.S., including housing segregation, predatory lending, the decline of unions and tax policies that favor the wealthy. Desmond says that affluent Americans, including many with progressive political views, huh? Huh? benefit from corporate and government policies that keep people poor. That's the important part here. And I guess uh, I, there was I saw something on social media today that's uh, probably an apt warning here. I didn't put it aside. I just thought it was, you know, that was well stated, but not necessarily news. So I didn't put it aside. But somebody, uh, I'm going to have to paraphrase, basically saying, uh, reminding people that and I think they were, they were headed down a slightly different path, probably talking about uh, diversity and inclusion and equality programs, probably not directly addressing actual CRT, but just generally speaking, uh, uh, also, uh, touching on issues, I guess, like reparations, which, uh, you know, is the trigger word that scares lots of people. Um, but pointing out that, uh, a lot of times, uh, well, particularly, I, I guess the people who feel somehow targeted by those discussions, I guess white people, uh, the, the admonition not to, well, uh, I, I believe that the way they put it was, listen, this is not people who are seeking justice don't necessarily mean that there has to be an inquiry as to guilt 
in all of this. Um, that uh, it doesn't require necessarily a a conclusion about guilt, but that the people who are most afraid of these inquiries feel that that's exactly what the purpose of it is, to, to lay the blame at someone's feet. And really, it's uh, it should be viewed more along the lines of, well, why don't we figure out what needs to be done to correct for it? It doesn't necessarily require a finding of guilt in order to uh, prescribe a corrective. And that's true. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, well, we're still dealing with the fact that a lot of people feel like, uh, well, you know, even if the guilt isn't uh, uh, explicitly laid at our feet, we still feel it nonetheless. And so therefore, that's uncomfortable and I don't want to feel it. And so therefore, we should not have these inquiries. That's the position Ron DeSantis is defending. And I think it's equally applicable to this discussion because it's intertwined and I think um, uh, perhaps inextricably with uh, the economic questions here. But again, this isn't necessarily about guilt. It's simply acknowledging that things have happened. And I think progressives should be able to do that. I hope so. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the K-Grown Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Did you run away because you were afraid I was going to lay guilt at your feet? Don't worry. Let's just continue with the inquiry here. Um, but uh, that sort of side reference was prompted by the end of the last paragraph we completed here where our sociologist, Princeton sociologist uh, Matthew Desmond, says that affluent Americans, including many with progressive political views, that's you, Benefit from corporate and government policies that keep people poor. And that's a, a leap just slightly beyond where I thought you, you well, perhaps those of you might have, uh, who are listening along might have thought it was going to land. Uh, I think probably most progressives would acknowledge, hey, I benefit from corporate and government policies. Yes. And so therefore, don't worry about it, though, because, you know, I'm not a hypocrite about it. I know that I benefit from government and corporate policies that benefit me and uh, and uh, that I'm not going to be a hypocrite about it like uh, some conservatives and say, no, 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 I'm pulling myself up by my bootstraps. You see, that gives me a one up on them. They're lying to themselves. I accept the truth. But uh, one additional truth that should probably be pointed out that will make people a little bit uncomfortable, but uh, good, strong progressives will say, no, I can handle that, right, is that not only are you benefiting from corporate and government policies that are aimed at helping you know, the wealthy and you're acknowledging that you accept them, but you should also acknowledge that they eh, perhaps by necessity hurt the poor and keep people poor in order to help keep relatively wealthy or well-off people wealthy or well-off. You should recognize that it has a negative impact. It's not just a positive impact on you. There's also a negative impact on others and uh, you should come to terms with that. Now it goes on. The article says uh, most government aids goes to aid goes to families that need it the least. Desmond says, which is uh, not an unfamiliar concept either. And in the private context, we I always uh, joke about that. And it's, I don't joke about that subject. I do joke about that. I joke about any subject, I guess. But when I when I, when we think about the hundred and twenty five thousand dollar gift bags that are distributed to already wealthy celebrities at the Oscars, for instance. Uh, no different on the governmental end. Most government aid goes to families that need it the least, Desmond says. How? How can you say that? In what sense? You probably already know. If you add up the amount that the government is dedicating to tax breaks, mortgage interest deduction, wealth transfer tax breaks, 
right? Intergenerational wealth transfer and others. Uh, uh, the inheritance tax. Cut the inheritance tax. You're hurting poor farmers or whatever. Okay, yes, but also, you know, very wealthy people um, who aren't farmers. Tax breaks that we get on our retirement accounts, our health insurance, our college savings accounts. You learn that we are doing so much more to subsidize affluence than we do to alleviate poverty. True, right? And now it comes down to a philosophical difference, I think, and he addresses this, in how people view it. But I think maybe the philosophical difference in how people view it may be driven by the psychological difference in what I need to, how I need to define these things so that I don't feel that guilt that the person who was addressing racial issues was talking about this morning on social media, right? I don't want to feel that. That's not fair. I'm a progressive person. I shouldn't have guilt. I'm doing so much to help. Yes, yes, but more can be done. Yeah, the feeling may be guilt, but it's not necessarily the intention of the, you know, the metaphorical indictment that's being handed down here. It's not that I need you to feel guilt. It's that I need you to feel that you need to act in the interest of equity. Can't you do that without feeling guilt? If guilt is what drives it and drives you to do these things, I guess that's good. But there are people who are reactionaries when it comes to, you know, you, you can't guilt them into doing things. You have to find a different way of persuading them of the rightness of doing it. Guilt works for uh, progressives and Catholics and Jews, I guess, and probably a lot of other people too. But, you know, uh, as the punchline goes, it, it works on uh, those three groups instead. Uh, all right. Uh, or in addition to everybody else. All right. But if it was everybody, then it would be working. It's the, I mean, I offer this up as a, as a way of reminding us that the, we need to find different language for the people for whom guilt not only doesn't work, but drives them in the opposite direction. That's what this is really all about. Not that you should feel guilty, but uh, if you feel guilty about anything, feel guilty about not finding a guilt alternative that can work on Republicans who have made themselves guilt proof by killing their consciences. All right. So as we say, most government aid goes to families that lean it the least. What do we mean? We mean mortgage interest deduction, wealth transfer, tax breaks, tax breaks for retirement accounts, health insurance, college savings accounts. Uh, Republicans tend to convince themselves that's not government handout. That's the government keeping their hands off our money. This is how they you know, change the ground underneath this question so that they don't have to feel guilty about it. But um, uh, the, the plain fact of it is that tax expenditures are what we call these uh, tax write-offs and benefits that people get through the tax system. They are viewed properly. They are expenditures by the government. We will forego collecting this money in taxes in order to help you do this, that, or the other thing. Uh, Conservatives and denialists of various stripes say, no, 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 that's the government not taxing money that I've earned, letting me, as we say, keep more of my own hard earned money in my pocket, not a gift from the government. But when you look at the record of how the courts have regarded these things, there is clear precedent, even Supreme Court precedent, uh, making clear that yeah, the option to forego collecting taxes on this money is an affirmative subsidy to the people getting that benefit. That's just, that's what the Supreme Court has decided about these things and how to regard it. There are two different approaches to it and they've decided which one it is. They may overturn that now that more conservatives uh, occupy <clears throat> more of the Supreme Court, but at the moment, that's how it stands. That's the flat out answer to this. So despite the daunting statistics, Desmond remains optimistic that the U.S. can make progress in its war on poverty. He says that labor unions and housing activists are creating movements that are stirring and growing around the country. My hope, too, is in the fact that ending poverty in America is better for all of us, he says. In other words, once we realize that, and it's better to end poverty, and everybody benefits from ending poverty, then there will be motivation to do so from the conservative side as well. 
because they'll say, oh, I benefit? Well, in that case, let's go ahead and do it. But it's not that easy to convince people and get them to that point. It is clearly better, as he says, for folks that are facing homelessness and hunger and humiliation, but it's also better for those of us who have found security that are diminished and depressed by all this poverty in our midst. So I do think there's quite a lot to be hopeful about, as much as uh, some people seem to be unwilling to uh, help or unwilling to, uh, say, use the government in order to help with these situations. They do feel like, hey, I would feel better if there wasn't poverty and there weren't people suffering from from poverty asking for my help. All right, well, to the extent that you would like to live in that world, why don't we create that world? Well, why should I do that? It doesn't help me. Well, maybe it does. All right. So anyway, uh, this is the setup to the piece here. But now, uh, I guess Dave Davies interviews um, Matthew Desmond about this. And so we'll try risking it once again using the interview format here on the radio, but without playing their interview, because that would be a copyright violation. Here are the highlights from this interview on uh, the question of, and it's not a straight transcript this time, uh, on what we can learn from LBJ's War on Poverty. Matthew Desmond says, the poverty rate between 1964 and 1974 fell by half. So the Great Society and the War on Poverty made an incredible difference. There were really robust interventions into the lives of the poorest families in America. They made food aid permanent. They expanded Social Security. There were so many elderly Americans dying penniless before the War on Poverty and the Great Society. And there was this massive gain in pulling older folks out of poverty. And I feel... That we should, that should give us a lot of hope, actually, because there's some of us that say, well, government aid doesn't work. It's not powerful. But the great society in the war on poverty uh, had this incredible, incredibly historical precedent for the good work that the government can do. And it's also important to realize that when those programs were rolled out, Congress looked a lot like Congress does now. It was polarized. It was obstructionary. The Southern Democrats were aligning with Republicans to block progressive reform. And even in that situation, a situation that looks a lot like Washington today, these incredible reforms were passed. So why? That's a good question. And I think the reason is, and this is an idea that I borrowed from Julian Zelizer's fantastic book, The Fierce Urgency of Now. You've heard that. The reason is grassroots organizers, like the civil rights movement and the labor movement in particular, putting unrelenting pressure on lawmakers to move their hand. So I think if we want to confront this problem, I think that our hope lies in the movement. All right, maybe. What about on how homeowner tax breaks help the wealthy at the expense of the poor? Let's get back to that one. Uh, and I guess the answers over various sets of questions are offered up here. If we're homeowners, and many of us are, and we deduct the interest of our mortgage from our tax bill, that's a government benefit. And many of us say, well, that's very different than a housing subsidy or food stamps. But I disagree. And, you, you know, economically, you really have to. Both of those things cost the government money. And both of those things drive up the deficit. And both of those things put money in our pocket. So instead of taking the mortgage interest deduction, the government could just mail you a check, right? That's just a different way of handling the same amount of money. Instead of saying, take it off of your mortgage or take it off of your taxes. And, you know, maybe you get a tax refund. Maybe you don't. I don't know. But you owe less. Less of your income is considered taxable income thanks to the mortgage interest deduction. The other way we could do it is simply say, and, and by the way, this would come a lot closer to the supposed Republican ideal of being able to file your taxes on a postcard. If you just simply followed the existing rules and the existing law, um, and there's a lot of different nuance to that too, right? But, um, uh, I guess where we come to the problem of, you know, well, conservatives say this isn't, uh, this isn't 
a tax giveaway to us. It's not a gift to us. It's just letting us keep more of our hard-earned money, right? The two ways of viewing uh, these deductions. Uh, the basic rule of the IRS here and, and, and the Internal Revenue Scheme is that there's a tax on all income, and as the phrase goes, all income from whatever source derived. It doesn't matter legal, illegal. It doesn't matter you made the money working or you got it as passive income. All income from whatever source derived is taxable. And then the bulk of the tax code, the bulk of the complexity of both the tax code and the tax forms comes from writing different provisions in there to help advantage different people, different groups, all in the guise of, well, we're going to let you keep more of your hard-earned money. Well, that's nice, and it might even make good tax policy. But another way of doing it, by the way, without uh, presumably without making uh, people who benefit from the tax system all that angry. Like, what's the difference whether it's, I'll tell you what, instead of calling this income, we'll call this not income so that we're taxing you on less money, that tax deduction that we allow you. Just follow the rules. We're going to tax you on all income from whatever source derived. And then... If we make the decision that we think certain people should get money back because they are homeowners and they're paying a lot of money in mortgage, we'll mail you a check and that will reimburse you for the interest that you paid on your mortgage during all of this time. If, if we feel that that needs to be advantage, we'll send you a check. And people, I mean, I guess that's disfavored among the people benefiting from this thing because I would rather that the money just not leave my hands rather than send it to you and then have you send it back to me. But the accounting ends up becoming, you know, is the same in the end, right? So in that sense, you should have no preference. But of course, you do have a preference because you might not, I don't know, maybe you don't trust the government to send the money back to you. And I can, you know, understand that. But that's all we're talking about is a transactional difference. So back to what we were saying here, right? They could, instead of taking the mortgage interest deduction, government could just mail you a check. That would be the savings that you would take. So it's all the same difference, unless you don't trust the government to send you the money. If you look at the amount of money we spent on homeowner tax subsidies, like the mortgage interest deduction, that's around $190 billion a year. Well, how much have we dedicated to housing assistance for low-income families? Well, as it turns out, it's about $50 billion a year. So that's just a colossal difference. It really is. That's 90 plus another 50, $140 billion difference. That's $140 extra billion dollars spent on people wealthy enough to have their own home and be paying their mortgage and Fifty billion versus one hundred and ninety billion spent on people who are too poor to be able to afford a house, much less a mortgage to do it. Uh, and shouldn't the poorest be? And we keep, you know, means testing everything. We don't want the money accidentally spent on people who are too wealthy to to you know uh, deserve it, whatever that's supposed to mean. But when it comes to spending on supporting housing for everybody in America, we spend fifty billion on the people who means testing would tell us need it the most and $190 billion on people whom means testing would tell us don't need it at all. Wow, that's wacky. Cuckoo. Okay. Anyway, uh, so it is just a colossal difference. And as you know, if we didn't have so many, uh, or at least, and you know, not as you know, but if we didn't have so many evictions and so many families paying 50, 60, 70 percent of their income on rent today, well, maybe we could live with that inequality, but apparently we can't. It doesn't make sense to have an enormous, painful rental housing crisis and to be spending so much money, mostly on families with six-figure incomes, who are, in fact, the biggest beneficiaries of the mortgage deduction. And I guess what really angers me, that would be Matthew Desmond, about this conversation is that a lot of times when we put forward a proposal to stabilize people's housing situation or cut child poverty in half, we hear over and over again, how can we afford it? How can we afford it? And the answer staring us in the face, like 
We can afford it if as many if many of us took a little less, took a little less from the government. Now, conservatives are up in arms. What do you mean take? You mean uh, you keep less, not take more or take less from the government? Well, uh, it depends how you view it. But of course, I've also told you how the courts already view it. That's the answer. I know you differ, but that's the answer for now. What about on the decline of the investment in public services? Well, he has this to say. When you have a country like ours, where there are millions of poor people living alongside millions of people with considerable means, a system locks in. A system for private opulence and public squalor. And this is an old phrase. It goes back to the Roman time. So we're doing great in solving it. But it was really brought out and brought to life by the mid-century economist John Kenneth Galbraith in his wonderful book, The Affluent Society. And it goes something like this. If you are a family of means, you have the incentive to rely less and less on the public sector. So we used to want to be free of bosses, but now we want to be free of bus drivers. We don't want to take the bus. We don't want to often enroll our kids in the public school system. We don't need to play in the public park or swim in the public pool. We have our own clubs and our own schools. We have our own cars. And as we withdraw into the private opulence, we have less and less incentive to invest in public services. That is an interesting point. You take, you own a car and you don't have to deal with riding the bus and all the headaches that it entails. Well, then, one, it becomes easier and easier for you to vote for people who are going to cut uh, public support for the bus system so that it keeps getting worse and worse. But it's not your problem. It's the problem of the people who can't afford Range Rovers who are or, or anything else, Subarus, uh, Toyotas, used Kias, whatever it is, and have to take the bus. But that's their problem and not yours. We don't need to pay for a public swimming pool anymore because rich people have their own or they belong to private country clubs and go swimming there. And uh, the fact that uh, these things are either disappearing or falling apart doesn't seem to worry them. You know, people who have withdrawn into the private opulence, as they say. And also, by the way, it also means that the interest base in maintaining these services becomes smaller and smaller, and uh, they can be cut in general, not just uh, you know each specific program, but public services in general can be cut because fewer and fewer Americans who are uh, voters are personally invested in keeping these services available. I don't need that. Cut it. And... Uh, that's actually part of the reason why Social Security was built the way it was and why there was originally not supposed to be, you know, means testing on these things. Everybody was supposed to be participating in this program so that it would have a universal constituency. Everybody gets a piece of this, so it's okay to maintain it, is the idea. Uh, and we're chipping away at that as time goes on. Uh, what about on the politicization of government aid? Desmond has this to say. A lot of us are getting these tax breaks, and we don't see that as a government helping us. We see that as us getting to keep more of what is rightfully ours. We discussed this. And often that leads to a kind of attitude, a political attitude, where we don't think the government is in our lives. We definitely see a lot of that among conservatives. And well, although we also see more and more crying about the government being too much in our lives. So it's a little bit of both. <laughs> it depends. All the bad stuff, they're in. The good stuff, that's not them. Anyway, and so those of us who are more apt to take that mortgage interest deduction are also more apt to vote against affordable housing proposals. Because, of course, that would make taxes go up, which means I can keep less, right? But that's actually just a more equitable distribution. Why is government funding flowing to the people who are affording their houses okay on their own? Or in some cases have two, six, ten houses. Why keep subsidizing that? Of course, you're not supposed to be able to take the mortgage interest deduction on all those houses, but lots of people cheat and don't get caught, too. But some people, even following the rules, just find their subsidies elsewhere. Anyway, those of us who already have employer-sponsored health insurance, 
which, by the way, is government subsidized in a massive way, right? Uh, we have employer provided health insurance. Why, uh, is that, uh, how is that government subsidized? Well, the subsidy goes to the, in, to the employers who provide it for you. They are incentivized to do so by tax deductions for that expense. And it gets provided, but provided only to people who have stable, steady employment that comes with benefits. Once again, the top of the food chain, economically speaking. But there is a massive government subsidy to it. Well, those people who already have employer-sponsored health insurance, often apt to vote against the Affordable Care Act. And it does have this kind of strange, political, maddening irony in our lives. It's a brief way of summing things up. Uh, what about on tax breaks for the wealthy? This one statistic, Desmond says, that I calculated just blew me away. So a recent study was published, and it showed that if the top 1% of Americans just paid the taxes they owed, not paid more taxes, you don't have to raise the rate on them or anything like that, I would say, uh, he would say, uh, we as a nation could raise if everybody just paid what they were supposed to pay and didn't cheat, much less, not use the tools that are legally at your disposal. You can still do that and still have to pay a lot more taxes. It's the cheating I think that they're talking about here. So if everybody just paid what they actually owed, even with all the deductions available to you, we as a nation could raise an additional 175 billion dollars every year that is just about enough to well, pull everyone out of poverty every parent every child every grandparent so we clearly have the resources to do this it's not hard i don't know that it's not hard but it's not hard to find the resources that could theoretically do it although i imagine that somehow eventually the problem would exceed the amount of money that we would be able to raise in order to do it, but it's a good start. $175 billion basically is being missed because we can't actually force everybody and enforce the rules evenly across the board for everyone and get everyone to pay because people use weird loopholes and nuance it and say, you know, this isn't what this loophole was for, and they end up losing their tax cases occasionally. Uh, when they go to fight it, but then the government ends up collecting pennies on the dollar just to get a settlement in place. Anyway, this is a rough estimate, this $175 billion estimate. I arrived, Desmond says, at this number by looking at everyone under the poverty line, calculating the average it would take just to bring them over the poverty line, and that might not even be enough, and adding that all up. It's pretty equivalent to what we could earn by just enforcing fair taxes at the very top of the market. What else could we do with $175 billion? Well, we could more than double our investment in affordable housing. We could establish the extended child tax credit that we rolled out during COVID that was basically a check for middle and low income families with kids. That's all it was. And that simple intervention cut child poverty almost in half in six months. Remember that? We could bring that back again with $175 billion and still have money left over. And sure, it's just a policy choice that we decide not to do that. Uh, what about on how simple interventions could make a huge impact? That sounds good. What simple interventions? A lot of us thought that people weren't applying for food stamps or applying for wage supplements because they were stigmatized, they were embarrassed, and there is something to that. But the weight of the evidence, I think, suggests that the reason people aren't accessing aid is because it's confusing and hard to apply for. Often you have to apply every year, again and again, and people often lose their aid just because they couldn't make the appointment or forgot to reapply. And so there are small, tiny interventions that address those problems and see massive returns on people accessing aid that they need. For example, if you make the font bigger, I mean, this is that talk about a simple solution, make the font bigger and clearer and use less words. That's hard for me. You can get many more people applying for the earned income tax credit, 
This benefit is designed to lift poor working families out of poverty, right? That's even the ones that Republicans say they want to help. People who are working, but then they find out that they're brown and they don't really want to help them. That's the real issue. This benefit is designed, of course, like I said, to lift poor working families out of poverty. If you connect elderly folks with someone that just kind of walks them through the application process of applying for food stamps, you get many more folks in their silver years having access to more food security. There is, are just incredibly simple interventions that can get people connected to aid. And we should put those in place immediately. There's much more to it, of course, but not much more to the article. In fact, that's the end of the article. But uh, you should take a listen, perhaps, to the extended interview, which runs some 35 minutes. I just, you know, it wasn't news, and a lot of this was already known to a lot of the people who listen to this show, but I just thought I should point it out, and it brought a, gave us an opportunity to talk about uh, some of the things that uh, Greg talks about in a, in a roundabout sort of a way, that if you can move the focus off of the guilt, and I don't know how to do that for people who have, you know, some sort of mental block about it and insist that it has to be about guilt or it's about nothing... But find some way of saying, okay, forget the guilt, put aside the guilt, solve the problem. Like the Problem Solvers Caucus might do. But somehow the Problem Solvers Caucus always ends up being the largest impediment to solving these problems. I don't know exactly what it is. But we've got some issues, America, and it's time to work through them. Okay, one way to work through them. Well, why don't you listen to Justice Putnam in the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, which comes up next right here on Netroots Radio, a larger umbrella for solving or at least addressing some of these problems. So do stay tuned. From NetrootsRadio.com, you have been listening to KGRO in the morning with David Waldman. Well, it looks like even... Justice Putnam can't avoid Israel entirely. That's on his agenda for the program starting next. Also, of course, right here in America, a right-wing think tank tied to deep right-wing dark money has jumped into the Wisconsin Supreme Court race. No doubts about that. And lots more, of course, from around the country and around the world. Stay tuned.